Good evening. I, we're ready to begin. <laughs> so this evening we have another great speaker, David Gross, uh, who is Ambassador and U.S. Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Ambassador Gross. Uh, he served since August 2001 as the U.S. Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy. He was nominated by President George W. Bush and unanimously confirmed by the Senate. Ambassador Gross began his career in communications 25 years ago. After graduating from the University of Pennsylvania in 1976 with a BA in economics and receiving his law degree from Columbia University in 1979, Ambassador Gross joined the law firm of Sutherland, Asbill, and Brennan. In 1994, he left the firm to become Washington Counsel for Air Touch Communications. AirTouch was the world's largest wireless telecommunications company with extensive interests in the United States, Europe, Asia, and elsewhere. Since joining the Department of State, Ambassador Gross has addressed the United Nations General Assembly and has led more, than, uh, led more U.S. delegations to major international telecommunication conferences than anyone in modern history. Ambassador Gross has been a member of the UN Information and Telecommunications Technologies Task Force. He has also led interagency telecommunications delegations to many countries, conducted bilateral discussions at senior levels with representatives of more than 70 countries, and provided commercial and policy advocacy on, be on behalf of the U.S. and companies and markets around the world. So I think we're going to have an interesting discussion this evening. Uh, will you please welcome Ambassador David Gross. My son is a, a senior in uh, university, and uh, I don't think he could make it this late uh, because he's usually up too late the night before. So I'm appreciative that you guys, uh, I guess, well, it's early in the week, I guess. You can still can gut it out for tonight. I appreciate that very much. Uh, a couple of things, uh, uh, sort of preliminary. I, I thought I would do, if it works for you guys, is talk for maybe about half an hour or so. Uh, tell you a little bit about what it is I do, talk a little bit about the relationship about telecommunications and technology to foreign policy, a little bit about how we do foreign policy, uh, the issues about various countries and the like with regard to the internet, telephony issues generally and the like. Then thought I'd spend the you know, 45 minutes or an hour, whatever you'd like, uh, taking questions. And let me be clear at the beginning, I'm happy to take questions on, on virtually any topic. Uh, obviously, I'm particularly interested in talking about technology. I'm also interested not just in questions, but in comments that you have uh, about technology, how it's used, how you see it uh, affecting uh, you and the future. But also, I'm happy to take questions on anything having to do with foreign policy. So if you have a question or a comment about what's going on in the Middle East and Palestine, or in the Palestinian territories, or with regard to Iraq, or the China, or anything else. If you've got a question or a comment, you know, uh, I'm happy to hear it. I'm more than happy to engage in a discussion about it. Um, I'm here for you. So just let, you know, be thinking about that as well. I know that uh, you all often write questions and so forth uh, for a variety of purposes. Again, happy to do it on any of these uh, subjects. I can't answer any questions about the final exam or any paper questions, but other than that, I think everything else is basically fair game. Uh, let me begin by telling you a little bit about uh, the job that I have, because it is really a unique job in all the world. Uh, usually, international telecommunications issues are handled by, in, in governments around the world by ministries of communications. And those are groups that have responsibility for the 
telecommunications issues in their own country, first and foremost, and then also usually the ones that represent their country in international organizations on high-tech issues, like issues before the United Nations or the International Telecommunications Union or any of the other types of activities, including bilateral activities, that is, one-on-one -on -one discussions between that country and another country. We do it a little differently in the United States. In fact, actually, we do it radically differently in the United States. And it's often the source of some interesting tensions and some comparative advantages and sometimes some comparative disadvantages. We have uh, the group that really regulates and sets our domestic telecommunications policy, are, as you know, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. Because it's an independent regulatory commission, that is, its five commissioners, including the chairman, cannot be fired by the president. They are appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, as was I, but they don't report to the president. So that means they can't get fired. They're really more a creature of Congress than it is a part, it, than it's, not, it's that rather than a part of the executive branch. That is sort of an interesting, trivial, perhaps, distinction, but it has some real life importance. Uh, under our laws, and particularly the Constitution, therefore, the FCC cannot represent the United States government, cannot represent you all internationally. That's setting a foreign policy and the like. That's reserved for the State Department. And so when Congress was grappling with the idea of exactly what should we do as a country in terms of how should we uh, handle international telecommunications, as that became a more important issue, particularly in the 70s and the 80s, the decision was made, not surprisingly, under our system at least, to put it in the State Department. And the reason it was put in the State Department, rather than some other part of the federal government, like the Department of Commerce, or elsewhere in the White House, where it was for a while, and places like that, was because the desire to make sure that our international telecommunications and high-tech policy was in sync with our overall foreign policy goals and interests. Now, at one time, many years ago, when high-tech issues were not as sensitive and not as important as they are today, uh, that was sort of a far-sighted approach. Today, you might well say that makes a lot of sense because the issues about international telecommunications, issues about the internet, issues about the free flow of information, issues about access to content, whether it's video, internet, audio and the like, seem very much a part of the discussions that countries have between each other and in large groups such as the United Nations. But that wasn't always the case. And so for most countries, as I said in the beginning, they do their work out of their communications ministries, which are expert, ministry, expert parts of the bureaucracy in that country on technical issues, telephone issues, satellite issues and the like, but often are not closely married to the foreign policy apparatus of those countries. And so when we get into large meetings like the United Nations, we generally have a comparative advantage. I don't think it was planned this way, but it turned out to be this way, because our State Department has the technical expertise to discuss these important issues involving the internet, involving satellites, involving access to information in ways that no other foreign ministry in the world has because those other foreign ministries have to then rely on the other parts of their government for the technical expertise. So having it in one place, having it at the State Department gives us a terrific advantage. Now my part of the State Department that is responsible is the part that's responsible for international telecom policy. And my role uh, as who's responsible for this is really twofold. I have as one of my uh, titles, I'm the U.S. coordinator for international communications and information policy. That means I talk with all of the various other parts of the U.S. government. People like the Department of Commerce, the Federal Communications Commission, the United States Trade Representative for Trade Matters, Department of Defense, Homeland Security, and the like, in order to bring all those groups together and discuss what our policy should be with regard to telecommunications, international telecommunications. 
because international telecommunications affects virtually all parts of our government. And then after we have those discussions, those interagency discussions, it's my responsibility and the responsibility of my team to then decide what the U.S. policy is. What should our position be in international organizations or in our negotiations with other countries directly? And so we lead, my team and I lead the U.S. delegations both to bilateral meetings, those are meetings with one other country, and multilateral meetings. So I have a group uh, that works uh, in my part of the State Department that specializes in multilateral affairs. Multilateral affairs are things like the United Nations, groups like the International Telecommunications Union, which is a UN-affiliated entity. It's the oldest UN-affiliated entity uh, in the UN family. Groups like APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperative, the OECD, uh, at least on the telecom matters, same thing with, uh, with APEC on telecom matters. CTEL, which is the group of the American states, the Organization of American States uh, that deals with telecommunications. We have meetings, we negotiate treaties, and we deal with issues about telecommunications. I'll give you one example. Next month, uh, in Geneva, there will be a one-month-long meeting, a whole month, which is terribly long, uh, to negotiate over how spectrum is used globally. Spectrum is used for cell phones. Spectrum is used for satellites. Spectrum uh, affect defense issues. Spectrum affects the ability of first responders, like firemen and police, to be able to, to deal with issues and talk to each other and the like. And issues about how that spectrum will be allocated, what parts of the spectrum should be used for what purposes, is an ongoing process as technology changes, as opportunities occur. And so there will be a one month long meeting that where the world will gather, about 170 nations will gather, a couple thousand specialists, technical specialists, will gather in Geneva, discuss, debate, and decide how spectrum should be used. What spectrum should be used for Wi-Fi? What spectrum should be used for satellites and the like? Not necessarily to change the way in which current uses are done, but how new uses, what type of new technologies are allowed. That will result in a treaty, which of course is perhaps the most significant type of legal document a country can be a party to. And so it's a treaty document. So we have responsibility to negotiate that treaty. That's what my organization does. Similarly, we deal a lot bilaterally. With virtually every country in the world, we have bilateral relationships, one-on-one -on -one relationships in which we discuss these issues. We do it for a lot of reasons. Trade is an important part of this. Opening up markets for U.S. goods and services in the area of telecommunications, computers, other types of high-tech devices, very important. So we work very closely with USTR and others in this. But we also work very closely with them because we think there's a whole host of other issues that affect, can affect, people in those countries. Primarily those affect, as I'll talk about in a moment, the economic ability of those countries to compete, to provide jobs for people in those countries, which is critically important for everyone, including us, because we want to make sure that there are enough jobs in enough countries around the world so that people don't have to come to the United States to have to work, that they don't create the sources of terrorism and other types of disequilibrium types of situations around the world that can affect us, as we learned so dramatically on 9-11. We also believe that there are social benefits, major social benefits that we'll talk about in a moment, that come from the use of technology. And of course there are, particularly since I'm at the State Department, I particularly love the fact that there are political benefits that come. And so what we find is that countries around the world, countries that agree with us on some issues, disagree with us on other issues, but virtually every country in the world wants to be close to us on the issue of technology. And the reason for that is that we are virtually universally viewed as being the place for high tech. 
That doesn't mean that there aren't great things happening in other countries in the area of high tech. South Korea's got terrific broadband. China's got a lot more cell phone users than anyone else in the world. But when people think about high tech, when people think about the internet, when people think about what's going to happen, everyone knows that it's the United States of America that's got the secret sauce. And everybody wants to know and have a part of that secret sauce. And we're happy to share it. Because what we talk about in that secret sauce is a unique combination of things that we would love to see other countries replicate. It's an issue of having an enabling environment. An enabling environment thing means things like rule of law, which we take for granted that there are laws that have to be followed. There are laws that protect intellectual property. There are laws that allow people to act in, in appropriate fashions. And those laws are enforced. But that's not the rule in many countries around the world. Many countries around the world, there is at best selective enforcement of a lot of these things. It's access to capital. It's capital formation issues. How people are able to start businesses. How easy it is to start businesses here. And of course, as you all know, the issue of starting businesses in garage and dorm rooms and so forth have become legendary. I'm sure all your parents expect you to create the next Google or Yahoo so that they can retire. So that's a unique sort of thing. It happens here in the United States and does not happen in much of the rest of the world. But also, it is an innovative economy. And it's an innovative economy for many reasons, including what you're doing right now. It's the way in which we do education in the United States. It's the idea of exposing people to new ideas in secondary schools and colleges and graduate school. And we generally are perceived, I think correctly so, to do a better job, certainly at the university and at the graduate school level, than anybody else. And part of the innovative economy that's so important is the free flow of information. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But it's the ability for you all to have access to what sort of information you want and need to have when you need it, when you want it. That, again, is not a universal truth. A lot of countries don't allow that. But that gives you all a comparative advantage over people sitting in lecture halls similar to this in many other parts of the world. I'll just digress for a moment to say that last week, I was in Vietnam having very serious discussions with the Vietnamese government. And I can talk more about that later. It's an absolutely fascinating place. It's extraordinary in many respects. It's a dynamic, economically dynamic, vibrant place. It's a really happening place. And I had an opportunity to give a talk at Hanoi University School of Technology, which is sort of the Iowa state of Vietnam. I had 250 students there. And just to give you a slight idea, I, I had a translator, because I don't speak Vietnamese, you'll be shocked to hear. And the students asked the translator to stop translating, because they all spoke English well enough to understand what we were talking about. And they were able to not only understand, but then to ask a large series of questions in virtually perfect English. And know what their questions primarily focused on? I gave them the same opportunity I'm going to give you all, and I'm sure you're going to take me up on the issue if they want to ask about any political issue that they wanted to. But what they really wanted to talk about, how do you get a student visa to the United States, and how do you get scholarship money? Because every single one of those incredibly bright students want to be sitting in the seat that you're sitting in right now. That's what they dream of. They want to be you because they recognize that what you all have is part of that secret sauce, part of the ability to change things for the better, to change their lives, to change your lives, to change the lives of their families, and ultimately for their country, just as you can do that for our country. And that's incredibly important. You see this at Iowa State. There are, what, 104 countries, I think, represented by students at Iowa State. 
That's a remarkable thing, and it gives you some sense. You go around the world, as I do, you don't see people from 104 countries at universities other than maybe one or two around the world. And that's, that tells you something. That's the marketplace at work telling you something that's going on. And it goes on first and foremost in the area of technology because of the free flow of information and the like. And so the areas that I deal with at the State Department is to try to take advantage of that, take advantage in a positive way, of use that which they would like to have from us as a way of trying to change, incremental sometimes, radically at other times, other governments, other countries, and most importantly, other people, to try to liberalize, to try to help them attain what it is that they want to have in their own unique way. Not because we're interested in making them like the United States. That's, I think, often a misnomer for across the board. We get no advantage out of that, and that would be just fundamentally wrong. Rather, what we want is that we want people to use technology, to have access to the internet, to have access to information, in order to benefit themselves in whatever way it is that they think they should be benefited. To help other governments and other countries benefit their people in the way that reflects their cultures, their histories, their societies. In part because that makes us richer. Richer not necessarily, although sometimes in the sense of dollars and cents, but richer in the sense that that's one of the things that makes life so wonderful. It's the tapestry. It's the, it's the fact that there is differences. As you see it here on this campus, so you see it globally. The fact that there are differences and that people can then take advantage of those differences in ways to learn, to change, to better themselves, to live a richer life. And so we deal with those sets of issues at the State Department. We also deal with a whole bunch of other issues having to do with national security. And the State Department is a major player in the national security apparatus of the United States. Uh, and so we are active in terms of trying to understand technology from a national security perspective. We deal with satellites. We are the part of the U.S. government that deals with satellites, you know, or, uh, orbital locations and the like. We deal with uh, uh, submarine cables and, and the like. But it gives us a real comparative advantage having that sort of expertise in the State Department as we talk about these various issues of human rights, of issues associated with political change around the world. Now, let me, let me talk a little bit uh, about sort of those three things I mentioned before. Economics, social, political. Let me start with the economics a little bit. Uh, I think it probably goes with, almost without saying that you all understand very well the economic impact that technology has. Now, let me give you just one statistic that might be slightly new and it's slightly controversial, but I think it gives you some sense. In the developing world, for every 10 cell phones per 100 person increase, so basically for every 10% more of the population that has a cell phone, the, the GDP, the gross domestic product, is estimated to go up by 0.6%. Just, there's a direct correlation. And you might say, 0.6 doesn't sound like a very big number. But most countries are struggling, and struggling in the sense that they want to get to and grow, in many places, about 2 or 2.5% two a year. So 0.6 is a big deal. It means that you're having job creation, it means more money in your pocket in the developing world. And we see this at all levels. We see it, for example, if you go to Africa, you see farmers using cell phones. The fastest growing area in the world for cell phones is Africa. Now, I was in the cell phone business in the very beginning of the cell phone industry, back in the very early 80s. And we thought in those days that cell phones would only be for the rich. They were big and clunky and expensive. And we only thought that there's a very famous McKinsey study that said that in the United States, this is a study I guess in the, around 1980 or so, they said 
by the end of that century, by the year 2000, if everything worked out well, the size of the whole U.S. market was about 900,000 cell phone users. Shows you what predictions they're worth. There are now over approximately 3 billion cell phone subscribers in the world. I have a population of about 6.5 billion people in the world. That means, roughly speaking, half the world owns a cell phone. Doesn't use a cell phone, owns a cell phone. It was just a couple of years ago, there was a very famous Maitland study, Maitland Commission study, that pointed out that half the world didn't, had never made a telephone call in their entire life. In a short couple of years, that, because of technology, that has been radically changed that now about half the world owns a telephone, owns a cell phone. It's extraordinary. And why is that? Because people find value in that. They find it value in terms of dealing with their family, staying connected, but also businesses, particularly small and medium-sized businesses, farmers, in order to take their crops to find a higher price for their crops in Africa, in South Asia, in Southeast Asia. I've seen fishermen take, use cell phones to call to various ports before they bring in their catch. These are not big fishing boats, these are individuals, one and two people out trying to catch fish. They make a couple of telephone calls to find out where they can get the highest price for their fish. This has a huge impact. When you drive around Africa, you will see hovels that will have a telephone number. And in much of the world, you can tell it's a cell phone number by the prefix. And they have it. And they have it. These are day laborers. And they have it because they realize that it is worth the price of having a phone in order to be able to get the job for that day. Because people can now contact them and have them work for them for a day. And so we're seeing a tremendous impact, tremendous economic impact on individuals, not just wealthy individuals, not just middle class individuals, but some of the poorest people in the world. Cell phone usage in India, for example, is growing at more than six million a month. More than six million new subscribers a month. And almost all of those subscribers are coming from the poorest parts of that country. That's where the growth is. And that tells you something because they find value. These are people who don't have money. But they find enough money to be able to buy a cell phone because that helps them earn some money, helps them better their lives, helps them stay connected, helps them earn a living. It's quite extraordinary. So the economic impact is tremendous. We get a lot of publicity, of course, and rightfully so, about the economic impact of the internet, about the economic impact of broadband, all which is true, but it goes deeper than that, and particularly deeper in the developing world. The social impact is also extraordinary. And the social impact, of course, you see all the time. E-government, the ability of governments to provide their services to more people electronically. That's important for a lot of reasons. We all see it in our daily lives, whether it's getting a new driver's license or registering to vote or doing a whole host of other things which you can do electronically in many places. But also it's important because one of the big issues in the world and most of the world is corruption. We like to gussy it up and call it transparency, but it's corruption. Shakedowns, often by government officials in much of the world. And so as government procurement moves more and more online, it becomes tougher and tougher to have that same sort of corruption, which takes away from the ability of entrepreneurs to do the right thing. It takes away uh, the uh, losses that occur in otherwise in, in corrupt societies. And so Romania is an example where they're very proud of the fact that they have moved much of their government procurement online in order to help combat that type of problem. Medical services online, be able to provide medical information, provide access to medicines in a way and medical care through technology, particularly wireless technology, but also, of course, the internet. We see that every day here. It is having a profound impact, particularly in Africa and elsewhere, 
in the developing world. But we see a huge change as a result of those social benefits that come from being connected. And I would say one of the great social benefits that some of you see, but many of you probably haven't seen, is keeping families connected. Not necessarily connected in the same way that you probably see every day of trying to stay connected with friends and relatives and families, members as you're at school, with your friends as you're at school. But for many people in the developing world, some member of their family has to move abroad, has to go to another country to find a job. That splits apart families. Through technology, wireless telephones, voice over the internet, Skype type services and the like, millions and millions of people around the world are able to keep their family connected. Fathers are able to stay connected with wives, children, and the like. And that has a profound impact socially across the board. These things don't happen by accident. The cost of telephone services have plummeted because of technical change and changes by governments. What we try to do is a little bit of both. As you know well, the internet itself was created largely by DOD funding and the like, US government funding, to try to develop a technology, not so much for the purposes of which is used today, but for other purposes, but then was able to morph into what we see today. The fact that gov government, working with industry, with universities and the like, are able to develop newer, cheaper, more robust, more exciting new technologies that are able to keep people connected are extraordinarily important. But married to that has to be appropriate government policies. For much of the world, up until very recently, governments control telecommunication services in their country. Some of them still do. And they would restrict who could provide the service, what the prices for those services would be, and often who could receive those services. And so what we have done over the past few years actually for a good number of years, but we've been doing it very actively for the past six years, is to go work with governments around the world to help them understand better why market forces, why competition will work well for them as governments and particularly well for their citizens. Because what we are committed to is what we see every day here, that competition among service providers as allowed for by government, provides for lower prices, new innovative services, and a path forward towards the future. And so that doesn't happen by accident. We have to help governments understand these things. We have to provide capacity building support. We go there, we send experts to countries. We have meetings with them, we sit down with them, we talk with them, we explain. We have technical experts talk about spectrum-related issues. We have expert economists talk about economic-related issues, about how telephone companies should connect to each other. We have technical experts talk about various technical issues about how telephone services can work. And we work very closely at government-to-government -government basis to explain why it is that they should do the things that they should need to do to liberalize that sector because it provides economic benefits and because it provides social benefits. But what excites me even more than the economic benefits, which are exciting, and the social benefits that are extraordinary, are the political benefits that then flow from that. In about in the early 1970s, just about 30 years or so ago, there were probably about 40 democracies in the entire world. And that was a high watermark. That was an extraordinary thing. For about 40 democracies in the whole world. Today, there are about 120 democracies. Some freer than others, but about 120 plus democracies in the world today. We've gone up threefold in an extraordinary short period of time. As some, including the president, have talked about, we have had more democracies and more democratic institutions created in the last 30 years or so 
than in the previous 2,500 years. That's an unbelievable thing. It's an extraordinary thing. And there are obviously lots of reasons for it. And I don't stand up here and pretend to tell you that there's one reason for anything, no less something as profoundly as important about the rise of democracy around the world. But I am convinced, and others are convinced, that a very, very, very important reason for this were the technical and other changes associated with the rise of low-cost telephone services and the Internet. Because it was right around the time in the 19, early 1970s that we started to see satellites used by private industry and others to beam around the world news by video so that you could see what was happening in your own living room, whether in the United States or in Europe or in Asia, but what was happening. As you may recall, a little later in that decade, many of us saw the Vietnam War, which, by the way, in Vietnam is called the American War, but what we call the Vietnam War in our living rooms. And the political impact of that was extraordinary and reasonably unprecedented. Many of you may be watching uh, the PBS Ken Burns special that's been running this week on, called The War. It gives you some sense. It's about World War II, but it gives you some sense of the difference. Back then, there was no such ability to have access to information in real time. And you can only just wonder what World War II would have been like if you had real live reporting with video, with embedded reporters, talking about all the dark days of early World War II. But we didn't have that, for good or for bad. We had it in the 70s, for good or for bad. But it gave us, as individuals, lots of information. And it gave others around the world lots of information. The price of a submarine cable circuit dropped dramatically, going back a few years before the 1970s, around 1956. I like that figure because it's a nice round number. A single circuit, transatlantic circuit, cost about a million dollars. And that was a remarkable thing back then. Remarkable. Today, those circuits cost less than $200. It, the price has gone down about 99.9%. .9%. What that means is that the cost of transmitting information across the Atlantic, and the same is true with across the Pacific, even more so, and around the world has dropped dramatically. So it can be used for video, it can be used for internet, it can be used for voice. It means that people have access to information. Not just the information we often think about the internet as profound and as extraordinary as that is, but also because it allows people to talk to each other. And the political ramifications of people being able to freely talk to each other are things we often take, advantage, uh, we often take for granted in the United States. But it's something quite extraordinary for much of the world. So people talk. When people talk, they talk about family, they talk about friends, they talk about jobs, and they talk about political things. It's part of human nature. And so the political ramifications, as the costs drop, prices drop, availability skyrockets. I mentioned some of the figures. Over the past six years or so, just in the past six years or so, the number of users of the internet have gone up about threefold. Uh, in many, many countries, uh, the number of cell phone subscribers has gone up four, five, six, ten times. It's extraordinary. It's a sea change. It's a change that many people haven't fully appreciated. They know something's happening. And they don't know quite exactly what it is and what the ramifications are. But we see it in the way in which people act. We see it in the way in which people react, not only economically, not only socially, but particularly politically. There are a lot of examples about how people use cell phones, text messaging and the like, to talk politically, to act politically. 
I'll give you one example that we were talking, a bunch of us were talking a little bit earlier about that I think is particularly telling. During Saddam Hussein's regime, there were, not surprisingly, no cell phones in Iraq. There was a rudimentary um, telephone system that basically only a few people, relatively few, had access to. There was, by the way, a fairly sophisticated fiber optic system that was used for military purposes, so it wasn't as if they didn't have access to technology. And in fact, when, after the invasion, we found a lot of cell phones in containers, so it wasn't like they couldn't have access to the technology on wireless. But Saddam Hussein did not, have, did not allow for people to have cell phones. That's not an accident. He recognized that it was important for him to stay in power, that people not be able to freely talk. So he didn't allow that. Today, there are over 10 and a half million cell phones in Iraq. In just the past few years, from the time Saddam left to today, 10 and a half million cell phones. The impact of that is tremendous. When you're in Iraq, tremendous number of people have access to the internet now, all over Iraq. The impact of that, politically, just to give you one example, Many of you may recall when the election was held in Iraq. It was an extraordinary moment. Many of you may remember the purple fingers that people would show after they voted. What you may or may not remember is that there were tremendous threats made to people telling them not to vote by various groups who were against having the votes. The Sunnis, a whole bunch of others, Al-Qaeda, said, we will kill you if you vote. And that's no idle threat anywhere, and particularly not an idle threat in Iraq at that time. And so early that day, even though there was a lot of security, virtually nobody went out to vote. A few people went out to vote. People who I just can't even imagine how brave they are. I'm a big voter. I'm politically active. I don't think I would have gone out. I don't think I would have had the courage to go out to vote. But some people did. They found it within themselves to have enough courage to vote. And when they came out, they realized that, in fact, it really was safe. They were not killed. What did they do? They took their cell phones and they told others. They told others that it was safe to vote. And if you recall that day, you'll recall that over the course of that day, more and more people went out to vote. So that it eventually became a wave of people voting. And you'll recall lots of people with fingers in the air, painted, showing that they had voted. Extraordinary thing. I am not convinced that it would not have happened, to use a double negative, without cell phones, without the ability of people to communicate, to tell each other that it was safe. We see this time and time again, a lot of the so-called revolutions of Eastern Europe, happening, like the Ukraine and elsewhere, with text messaging, people telling each other where to go for the demonstrations. It's happened time and time again. So people, not surprisingly, using technology to be able to communicate, not only about economics, not only socially, but also politically. And we see dramatic, dramatic changes. In fact, let me just go back to Iraq for just a moment, uh, because there's one other sort of footnote to that that I think is interesting that's just occurred. Right after the war uh, ended, uh, and again, there had been no cell phones, uh, during the time that we were the official occupying force, we had to worry about licensing the cell phones. So a bunch of us had to worry about what that regime would look like, and there were decisions made to give temporary licenses, because under international law, uh, an occupying force like the United States, was not, you can't set into place things that will exist after the occupation ends. Seems reasonable. And we wanted to end that occupation quickly. We just didn't know when that would be. So we sort of took a guesstimate and we sort of issued licenses, or the CPA issued these licenses for about 18 months. 18 months came, left. There was, in fact, an Iraqi sovereign government. We no longer were an occupying force, but they hadn't figured out exactly how to do any more licensing. Well, they just finished doing, doing their licensing, uh, permanent licensing. There were three. Uh, licensed cell phone providers in Iraq. 
competing with each other. And uh, the licenses went out for auction just a couple weeks ago. That's an interesting auction. You already know there's a good number of cell phone subscribers. You're going to buy those licenses. That's probably worth something. But, gee, there's an awful lot of instability in this area. And who knows what the future These are 15-year licenses you're buying. What's your guess about what the future of Iraq is going to be like? That's the question people had to ask themselves. And the bidding started. And the bidding went forward more and more. And ultimately, the three, each of the three licenses that were auctioned off, each one went for $1.25 billion, B with a billion dollars, plus 18% of their revenues had to go to the government. So on top of the $1.25 billion, another 18% of all the revenues had to go, plus there's another 15% tax on top of that, if you believe that. Each of those licenses was bought by a company in that region. These are Middle Eastern telephone companies operating in the region, very sophisticated, very well financed. They, this is a marketplace bet, you know, this is a non-ideological, non-political decision people are making, but they're betting an awful lot of money saying that they think that Iraq is going to get stable. Now, I'm not here to tell you it is or isn't. I don't have that sort of expertise. I'm just telling you a couple of facts about what a bunch of people have done very recently in terms of their own money trying to figure out what the future of Iraq is going to be economically. I think it's a fascinating set of issues and a fascinating set of Statistics. Same thing, which, by the way, is basically true in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a country that's extraordinarily poor, you know, extraordinarily mountainous, extraordinarily desolate, as you've probably all seen on TV. It had no cell phones under the Taliban. In fact, not only did it not have any cell phones, if you wanted to make a, an international call, you had to leave the country to make an international call under the Taliban. That's how concerned they were with telecommunications. I mean, it's extraordinary. Soon after the war ended in Afghanistan, uh, there were two cell phone companies licensed. There are now four operational cell phone companies in Afghanistan, with a fifth that's already just been licensed. That's amazing. There are five cell phone companies operating in Afghanistan. And there are something in the order of about one million cell phone subscribers in that very small, very desolate, very poor country. Because once again, people recognize the importance of technology to their lives, economically, socially, and once again, politically. We can go around the world and look at this time and time again. Africa, as I said before, is probably the fastest growing place in the world, at least in percentage terms. Both of the internet and of cell phones. It's amazing how ubiquitous the coverage is anywhere in the world. As I mentioned before, I was in Vietnam last week. I was driving in the central part of the country, having completed my, my discussions with the Vietnamese government in Hanoi. I was down in central Vietnam driving from Da Nang, which used to be a large military base many years ago on the coast, up to Hue, the ancient imperial capital of Vietnam. Everywhere as I went in Vietnam, I had no trouble having a cell phone signal, no matter where I was. But as I was driving between these two cities, towns, through the rice paddies, looking at the farmer, and then looking at the fishermen coming in, more or less in the middle of nowhere, what was I doing? Fortunately, I should tell you, I was not driving, thank goodness. That place is totally insane for driving. I was sitting in the back, reading the New York Times on my cell phone electronically, because I wanted to get the football scores. So here you are, basically in the middle of nowhere, connected, real time, instantaneously, to the New York Times, the Washington Post, Yahoo, Google, whatever I wanted to. I could do it. It's amazing. It's extraordinary. But it also means, going back to those students, I hope I made you a little comfortable 
about the fact that they all want to be sitting where you are. It gives you some sense of how special you are and this place is. Let me make you a little uncomfortable for a moment. A few years ago, you didn't have to worry about those kids. You didn't have to worry about them because they had no hope. They had virtually no hope because I could tell you with a high degree of precision what their future was going to be like. Because I knew where they were born, and if I knew who their parents were, I could tell you what their future was. And I could almost always assure you their future didn't involve you. Today, because of the internet and the same technologies we've just been talking about, each and every one of those students, each and every one of those bright, energetic, often English-speaking students, now has the same access to information you have. Because they have access to the internet. And they have access to distance learning like we're doing right now. And they have access to the same sets of types of opportunities that you have. And so, being here is very special. But it's not special in the same sort of way it was a few years ago. Because those are the same kids who want the same thing you want. And there'll be friendly competition. And maybe sometimes not so friendly competition. Because they want to develop the next Google and the next Yahoo. Just as much as you do. And they want jobs just as much as you do. And I'll tell you, those people are studying an awful lot. And they're hungry in every sense of the word. So this is a very globalized world. I know you guys have been reading things like the world is flat and the like. And these, Thomas Freeman is right on that. He's wrong on some other things, but he's right on that. It is a much more centralized world. And that's very good. And I'll tell you, from where I sit, that's a very good thing. I think it's a very good thing because I've got a lot of faith in you all. I've got a lot of faith in my son who's sitting in a... Well, he's probably not sitting in a seat like yours because he's probably off partying somewhere. But anyhow, same sort of thing. I've got a lot of faith in him as well. But it's not faith that comes from a historical inevitability. It means that we need to continue to work hard on what it is that makes us special. But it gives us some unique opportunities. Because what it means is just like they can change the world, you can change the world. And we've demonstrated time after time after time that it is people like you who really are changing the world. You're changing the world in ways that never before in human history were possible. Because you can have an impact not just on yourself, not just on your family, not just on your community, but on the world at large. And you can have it in ways that are easier, better, and probably more lasting than any other time in human history. Let me end with just another quick thought, sort of a random thought perhaps, but one that I'm, uh, I think that underscores the importance of what it is you're learning and how you're, you're learning. I read a book very recently uh, called The Black Swan. Uh, which I encourage people to read. It's uh, a very recently issued book uh, by a guy named uh, Nassim Taleb. Interestingly, born in Lebanon, a small town in Lebanon. Went to school in the United States. It's sort of a combination of economists in the sense of a, he's a trader on Wall Street, but also a philosopher type. And his book, and many times, is completely over the top in a lot of respects. But the book, which is entitled The Black Swan, comes up with what at one point, at one sense, is a very basic, very easy to understand concept, but at the same time is a very profound one that shapes all of our lives. The black swan that he refers to is a concept. The concept is to identify highly improbable. By highly improbable, these are things that you could put a million very smart people in a room and tell them to come up with every idea they can ever come up with, but this is so improbable it's not going to be one of those ideas. So it's something that is completely off the radar screen. Highly improbable events that are highly impactful. And what he says, when you think about your own life, you think about the internet, you think about lots of things that have occurred, highly unlikely, no one 50 years ago, no one would have thought there was an internet. Highly unlikely, 
Highly improbable, highly impactful for the reasons we've been talking about tonight. And you can go down, they're not that unusual. In fact, they're fairly common. So what he says, the re- repercussions of this are, first of all, don't be misled by history. Because history, as written by historians, are connecting dots that are not really connected. Because they are the result, in retrospect, of things that are made to appear to be historically inevitable, that of course are not at all inevitable, but really the result of completely unpredictable, highly impactful types of occurrences. So what he says, in essence, is be prepared. And that's what you all are learning to be. What he's really saying is, it's not about learning a bunch of things and knowing that if you apply those things, you can know what the future is going to be. Rather, what I think he is saying, and I think he's right, is that you need to be prepared for the unexpected, the completely unexpected, highly impactful thing that I cannot predict, you cannot predict, but we can all predict with almost certainty will happen. We just don't know what it is or when it will happen. And what that means is that you need to be flexible. That's why having an education like that you're getting here that helps you learn, that helps you think, that's what's important. It's the process of thinking, the process of critically analyzing that ultimately is what really matters more than it is any particular thing that you learn. It also means that those countries, those societies that are flexible are the ones that benefit and ones that will succeed. And I think one of the lessons that he does not make in the book that I took away, however, was that that's part of the secret sauce of the success of the United States. Because we are a flexible people, we are an adaptive people, we are people who are born of that, our legal regimes encourage that, our education reinforces that, and we all know that our future demands that. And so we don't know what the future is like, but we do know with a high degree of probability that something will happen, some technology will be developed that none of us, by definition, can even conceive of, even the guys in the lab down the hall. But yet, it will affect our lives dramatically. And so in order for all of us to succeed in every sense of the word of success, to be happy, to be healthy, to be prosperous, to have a better life not only for ourselves but for our kids, it means we need to be adaptable. It means we need to use technology, not to have technology use us. That's what we do with the State Department. We work with other governments, we work with other people to try to identify that, to try to understand that, and to try to work together. So it's not just you all, it's not just the people in this country, but it's everyone around the world has the same opportunities to be able to have that better life for themselves and their kids. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a few questions. Ambassador Gross, uh, can you talk about the administration's position on the internationalization of ICANN? Oh, sure. Um, The the question, if you make sure everybody heard it, uh, particularly those who are remote, uh, was to talk a little bit about our position on the internationalization of ICANN. Now, uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows what ICANN is. ICANN is a private, not-for-profit company based in California that was, in essence, created by the United States as an organization to try to help uh, manage the DNS, the domain name system and the like. Uh, during the World Summit on the Information Society, this UN Heads of State uh, Summit that we had in two phases, in 2003-2005, There were calls to internationalize it in the sense of have the UN or some other multinational, uh, multilateral uh, organization take over control of ICANN. Uh, Our position was that that would be inappropriate because we think that ICANN 
is, has done a good job. It needs to do a better job. Internationalization basically refers, can refer to different things. We support the idea that I can continue idea that I can continue idea that I can continue 